to the best of my ability. Okay, next on the agenda is a recognition of uh, the African American History Academic Challenge winner. So um, this evening we are pleased to welcome a group of smart and enthusiastic middle school students. The student teams participated in the 25th Annual 100 Black Men of Madison African American History Academic Challenge held in the Doyle McDaniels Auditorium on April 6th. The following teams placed first, second, and third in the competition. Would Dr. Rose, president of 100 Black Men of Madison, and the team members and coaches from third place Whitehorse, second place Cherokee, and first, first place Wright, please join us up front. learning, studying, drilling, and quizzing one another to earn the top three spots out of the 12 middle schools in the academic challenge. Congratulations to all of you, team members and coaches, for your passion, dedication, and accomplishments. We would also like to recognize your family members. If they are here, could you please stand? for your work on this event. For the past 25 years, through the African American History Academic Challenge, the 100 Black Men of Madison has provided our middle school students with this unique opportunity to enhance their educational experience, 
deepen their understanding of African American history, and interact with other students in a positive, friendly competition. This competition epitomizes black, black excellence as well. And for that, we thank you. I will now read a formal resolution recognizing the winning teams from all three middle schools. After the resolution is read, we would like to ask that the three winning teams stay on stage for the Michael McKinney Trophy to be presented to Wright. So this is the resolution. Whereas three MMSD middle school teams from Wright, Cherokee, and Whitehorse middle schools have studied and practiced for many hours after school along with their coaches to earn first, second, and third place in the 25th annual 2019 African American History Academic Challenge sponsored by the 100 Black Men of Madison. Whereas the African American History Academic Challenge is an educational program that embodies black excellence and is designed to enhance the study of African American history and encourages pride, self-worth, and appreciation of African American legacy and culture. Whereas the 100 Black Men of Madison has provided support and opportunities for MMSD students to study African American history over the past 25 years of the competition. Whereas the three winning teams are White Horse students, William Booker, Destiny Walker, and Tierra Mater, coached by Wilson Seeley, who took third place, Cherokee students Michelle Pincus, uh, Kiam Obusa, and Ebenezer Ildahu, Idowu, Idowu, um, Jr., coached by Shiloh Vines, who took second place, and Wright students Leilani McNeil, Mika Anderson, and Abby uh, Comerford, coached by Robert Kilberg, who took first place. <laughs> now there be a result that the Madison Metropolitan School District Board of Education recognizes and congratulates these three teams of African American history challenge competitors for their outstanding accomplishments while representing themselves, their families and peers, their schools and our district. Be it further resolved, this statement will be permanently imprinted in the Board of Education minutes for the meeting of April 29, 2019. Each year, the winning team of the African American History Academic Challenge is presented with the Michael McKinney Trophy. Named in honor of another champion, Michael McKinney, Mike, Mc, Mike was former NBC anchor NBC 15 anchor and community advocate who worked earnestly to provide meals to those in need in and around Madison. Once again, congratulations to all three teams and good luck to the right team at the national competition in Las Vegas, Nevada in June. <laughs>
was one who has helped us continue this legacy because she competed in the African American History Challenge poll a few years back. <laughs> <laughs> and she represented us in, I believe, Las Vegas. And we are going to Las Vegas, so that's a good omen. And for those of you that are not aware, we uh, have, in the 24 years that the competition has gone on and we've been involved, Mass Metropolitan School District has had a team that has been national champion seven out of 24 years. And we are defending national champions at this time. Uh, we also, uh, Spring Harbor won last year, Wright Middle School uh, in 2017, and we hope to uh, do well uh, this coming year. But what we have as a bestowal is the book that we use, our 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro by Henry Louis Gates. Each member of this year's championship team has wrote an inscription to Ali saying thank you for helping us to continue uh, this uh, most important work. We feel so blessed by you being in this position. We feel so blessed that, again, the school district has gotten behind this. And this is one of the few situations that I know of uh, in our city where we nationally compete academically and we win. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. from the Board of Education that's going to be read by Ali Muldrow. We are writing this statement in, united in our steadfast support of every person's right to be safe at school. We want you to know we hear students, teachers, and families as they come forward with strategies and solutions that exhibit the courage it takes to face the tragedies that have taken place in our schools. We are here to serve, to empower our community to make change, to uplift and strengthen education. Sexual violence must be taken seriously. We must do all that we can to ensure that our schools are places that promote the safety and dignity of all people. We would like to thank the young people who have come forward to share their ideas with us. Students have reached out to advocate for self-defense as physical education, as well as you've created murals in bathrooms and stairwells that celebrate consent, healthy relationships, and respectful boundaries. Yes. They have asked us to implement consent-based education and training for students and staff and much more. We urge students to continue speaking up and advocating for schools that are healthy and ever more safe. Yeah. We will settle for nothing less than focused leadership, expertise, precision, profound compassion, and accuracy when it comes to shaping the best possible outcomes for our young people. As Madison's first school board made up of entirely women, we are committed to ushering our community into the future by working to end sexual violence in our schools. This responsibility is worthy of our collective commitment to our students, teachers, and schools. The action this moment demands requires that we be thoughtful and devoted to our community by daring to believe that a better future is possible. We ask that you join us in building schools that embody the values of a safe, just, and welcoming community. In solidarity, Madison Metropolitan Board of Education. Thank you, Ali. Uh, next on the agenda. 
agenda's um, approval of the minutes dated February 4th, 2019. So I will move that the Board of Education approve the minutes from the regular meeting dated February 4th, 2019. 2019. Uh, any discussion? Ahmad, your advisory vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes 7 0. Uh, next on the uh, agenda are public appearances. Uh, and so we want to thank everyone for. Uh, that one comes with it. Uh, our next agenda item is public appearances. And we want to thank everyone who has come to speak your truth to us this evening and we are generally here to share this space. Given our new location this month, I wanna highlight a few things to help you ensure that our time together runs smoothly. First, thank you for signing up before 6 p.m. Thank you for keeping the aisles clear to ensure safety. Thank you for helping us to ensure that every speaker has an opportunity to make their comments. Remember that allowing any viewpoint to be shared is not an endorsement of that viewpoint, it's an endorsement of the right to speak. Speakers are welcome to speak on any topic at the regular board meeting, but we would like the speakers in the audience to know that board action and conversation is by law limited to the term items on our agenda, which means members of the board will not be able to engage in conversation with speakers. We are here to listen carefully. We will take your comments into account in our decision making and follow up with you where appropriate. Each speaker is given up to three minutes to speak you must be registered to speak and cannot give your remaining time to someone else. The lighting system will turn yellow and then red so you know when it's time to wrap up. If you've gone over your time, I will ask you to immediately wrap up your comments. Speakers who require language interpretation support in order to speak to the board will be given up to six minutes to speak, which should generally provide sufficient time for the interpreter to convey the speaker's message. Individuals with disabilities who require accommodations in order to register and to speak to the board will be granted such accommodation upon request. Other extensions may be granted only by the approval of the board. Thank you again for participating in tonight's meeting. Tonight we have 27 speakers signed up for public comment and we will start with speaker number one. We would appreciate it if speaker number two would make their way uh, down either aisle and towards the front and wait by the story <coughs> stairs until it's your turn to speak. Um, please be sure to introduce yourself. Thank you. Good evening. I want to begin by thanking all of you for your leadership. I'd like to welcome the new members to the board. It's really exciting to see all of you up here. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for bringing this meeting out to the community and for offering the opportunity for this meet and greet. I'm excited um, that that uh, represents a, a new approach and I'm excited to see this board continue to be creative and innovative and bold. I'm excited to see you all double down where MMSD has been really successful, including by approving the renewal of Nuestro Mundo's contract tonight. I'm excited to see you all find a way to benefit from the brilliance and dedication that the Free to Make activists have been bringing month after month. I think that's a tremendous resource that we can tap in our community. I'm excited to see you all figure out how to keep the lights on and the walls up and the pools non-toxic and continue adapting best practices like all day 4K or all day 3K, Montessori schools, art schools, and educational approaches that are rooted in principles of consent. And we've all got your back. We're here to support you. Thank you. Okay. I feel like most people know who I am, but I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Bianca Gomez, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the organizer in Madison. Um, as one of our youth said, our amazing youth said, um, you can't claim, the school board can't claim to care about black excellence and still have police in schools, right? <laughs> police don't ensure safety 
uh, for black and brown kids, they ensure uh, fear and violence, right? And that fear isn't just like some imaginative fear. That fear is the reality that they live every day, not only in our schools, but also in our community. So unless you are talking about removing police from schools, unless you are talking about truly investing into youth of color, unless you are have not letting our teachers and administrators put their hands on our children, then you can't be simultaneously talking about black excellence. And I've seen a lot of like op-eds, and I've seen a lot of um, community folks, well, not my community, but some community folks, uh, talk about the need for police in schools, and those opinions aren't rooted in actual research, right? Those opinions are rooted in uh, white supremacy, those opinions are rooted in fear, those are opinions are rooted in the experiences of a few heteronormative white kids, but not the experiences of black and brown kids, not the experiences of kids with disabilities, not the experiences of, of our queer youth, right? So I'll say, I've said it once, I've said it many times at the many school board meetings I've attended, but I'll say it again, state violence is not school safety. Say, say that with me, y'all. State violence is not school safety. Right? So research tells us that the history of police in schools are, is actually rooted in police entering schools during, during integration to control the behaviors of black kids specifically and brown kids specifically, right? It's rooted in white parents not feeling uh, safe with their kids going to school with our kids, our black and brown kids, right? So I uh, ask you all, what side of history do y'all want to be on? Do y'all want to perpetuate this history of white supremacy or liberal white supremacy in this case? Or do you want to uh, be on the side of history that challenges the status quo of anti-blackness in our schools and in our communities? And I really don't want that response in a thoughtful letter to the community. We want that with the motion to end police in our schools to end the contract with MMSD and MPD in the city of Madison. Yeah. Our youth really put school safety on, uh, on the table at this last election and the community responded with electing people who yeah. they felt like really cared about our kids and really um, cared about anti-blackness in the schools, really cared about any white supremacy in our schools, really talked about explicitly police violence in our schools. So we want those same folks to respond um, not only with words, but with action. Woo. Woo. All right. to like our folks that showed up that keep showing up because I see a lot of familiar faces out here. Um, I got here a little late. I was dealing with client stuff. So if you want to sign up, go ahead to the table that the water's on. Um, the second thing is I just want to like congratulate all our folks that came out to make this um, last school board election like monumental. Like we know what we want um, and we're trying through electoral politics to get some semblance of like risk mitigation for our kids while they're in the schools, but we know what we want and we actually make the changes. So thank you for showing up the way y'all did um, for school safety for black and brown youth and for electing the folks that y'all did. And we still got a lot of work to go, so thank you for that. I'll say for my part, because I do like civic engagement stuff, I saw a lot of like a lot of y'all out here not doing this stuff, so thank you. Uh, yeah, so I really am here to talk to y'all um, before I even heard the, the letter that y'all just read, um, it's really great that this is an all women school board. That's amazing. And it's really great. Um, it'll be really great for y'all to put some action behind that. Um, it, it'll take a lot more than just letters, right? And so I wanna talk to y'all about how removing police from schools is actually a gender justice issue. And it's actually dealing with specifically the harm that is done to women and girls, and then specifically black women and girls, who are sometimes, most of the times not even seen as gender. They're just seen as beings to be treated like garbage, like they are. So I'm going to read this quote, uh, this statistic out of a study done um, 
that says girls of color, particularly those who identify as black, African American, African diaspora, Hispanic, Latinx, and indigenous are disproportionately subjected to exclusionary school discipline measures such as suspension, expulsion, and referrals to law enforcement and arrests. School dress codes, hair policies, and discretionary discipline, discipline policies are also used to punish and shame black and brown girls in schools. Adding insult to injury made many black and brown girls who are punished for their forms of personal expression, which should be celebrated and welcomed, also experience sexual harassment and abuse in schools. While the experiences and voices of, of black girls in particular are so often silenced and overlooked in conversations on school discipline reform, black girls continue to be overrepresented in every discipline category in the nation's schools. What does that mean for us here? Because those are just some stats about the nation as a whole. At MMSD, black girls, black middle school girls were 100% of arrests with the most recent data that we could find for girls. Take the police out of schools. That means that black girls over the whole district were 13 times more likely to be arrested than their white and Latinx counterparts. Take the police out of schools. Please finish up, thank you. Right, thank you. Take the police out of schools. This is not a letter. This is not nothing that you need to be sitting down writing except, hey, police department, we don't need your services anymore. This isn't an accidental disparity. We're telling you that our black girls are seen as things, not even girls, to be locked up and pushed out of schools. Simple as that, take them out of schools. Thank you. Marco Rubio, please. Hi, my name is Margaret Rubio, and I want to start off um, by saying welcome, new board members, to your new adventure. Um, it'll be a ride. Um, I want to say that I took my son to Green Bay to, to testify in front of the Joint Finance Committee, and he did wonderful. It was great to see camaraderie between people of different groups, the AARP for special education, for people for Medicaid, Medicare, it was wonderful. The sad thing is, is that I didn't see anybody from the MMSD school district. Um, I missed the first three closer to me, so I had to go all the way to Green Bay, but it was worth the trip. I saw superintendents, I saw special education staff, regular staff, teachers, parents, a mayor, principals that were going to ask for this funding for special education. As we all know, it's very difficult to be in the MMSD school district, or any school district. Um, the special education is very, it's in a case of its own. Um, it's a lonely ride in special education. Um, so I'm hoping that me saying this out loud in front of everybody, more people would be more apt to just take a jot out, jot down to the Capitol Whatever your needs are, whether it's the policing, whatever, take your case to your legislatures. We, we grow in numbers, we work in numbers. We can do something. Um, my next thing is I wanna thank Nikki for shadowing my son at Badger Rock Middle School. I appreciate that. Uh, because of that, it helped improve the communication between the staff and myself regarding my son and his education there. Um, and the IEPs. We need to try to make sure that we are on the same page as a staff, as a team on the IEPs. My son has several invisible diagnoses and it's difficult, I understand. But when I try to talk to the principal or talk to the special education teacher or talk to a caseworker, it makes it very difficult, especially when we're not on the same page. I went to this last school team meeting and I was come up with the teachers do not want to talk. The special ed teacher and the other regular teacher do not want to talk. So they had to communicate by text. How is it when you're talking to the main point person for your son at school and they don't want to talk to you in a team meeting? They communicate by text and then a third party has to relay what they're saying because 
They don't want their words to be misconstrued or miscommunicated. I, as a mother, especially of a Latino child with special needs, have my words misconstrued, have my words miscommunicated all the time. And I was very happy when the principal said that if the team from his school felt like they were being made to feel uncomfortable, they could pause and take that break because he didn't want the teachers to feel uncomfortable. How uncomfortable do you think the parents are? And I just really wish that that would have been said to me, especially when you're first starting, when your child is first diagnosed with special, I'm trying to hurry up, I'm sorry. Yeah, especially when your child is newly diagnosed and you don't know, it's an intimidating situation. And then when a parent knows that they have their rights, then it becomes an issue, then it becomes a problem, and it shouldn't. And if I could just say one quick thing, just like with the police officers in the schools, can we just all humble ourselves and just try to get along? Try to find a kumbaya moment. It's a new team. We just gotta do better. We can find a way. We can. And we know women can get along better than men. So let's do it, please. Thank you. I, I would ask, just because we do have a lot of speakers tonight, if everyone could try to stay within their three minutes to be respectful of, of everyone's time here. Hi, my name is Marcus Bravo. I've actually been coming to these meetings for about a year now. So I've uh, different times been trying to call attention to the issues that I personally have with MSD. Um, this time I kind of ran into in a different direction. And I was wondering, did any of you go to the joint finance, joint finance committees that we had? Any raise of hands? Nobody? Well, I went to J21 and I got to testify down there because I believe in our special education system and I know that it needs more funding and it will help out our classrooms immensely. I saw a lot, uh, the same thing, I saw a lot of superintendents there, special education teachers, parents, and all these different constituents that were bringing all these issues to the table to let everybody else know where funding needs to go in order to improve things that are already set in place. And I'll, I know some of you are new, but I'll ask the same thing next year. Where were you? Our district struggled, like every other one in Wisconsin, to get reimbursement for services that are, that are supporting our students every day. And sometimes it feels like MMSD is oblivious to the fact that showing up at events like these can really impact our special education program in a positive way. And I not only come here to address concerns regarding my personal experiences, but I'm actually trying to make things better for the next family that comes along. I do this all on my own time, my own expense, and I believe in an inclusive classroom. I believe in an environment that helps our students reach their full potential. And I believe that MMSD should better support parents and their roles on the IEP team. My daughter is part of the 14.6% of students with disabilities that make up the classrooms in Wisconsin. I'm part of the 78% of parents in Wisconsin that feel that my school does utilize my involvement to better the special education services. But that also means that there's 22% of parents out there that don't have a special um, supportive educational classroom where their voice is heard. If 100% of our students are eligible to receive a free and appropriate public education, the parental involvement should be 100% appreciated as well. This year, there have been many changes that have created opportunities for advocates to bring attention to the needs of our inclusive classrooms. I invite you to be inspired as I am by the National Inclusion Project, which says inclusion is not simply about physical proximity. It's about intentionally planning for the success of all students. Hi, my name is Corey Webson, and I'm a senior at Memorial High School. I am also president of Memorial's Teal Ribbon Club, which strives in rape culture and advocates for survivors in our community. I think with the incident at East, it is important to look forward and see how our school district can improve to prevent future incidents and better support survivors. First off, education about rape needs to be provided, needs to be provided much earlier and in a more thorough way. 
considering many youth have already endured sexual abuse or rape by the time they are 12, having the Rape Crisis Center come in during 10th grade health classes is not soon enough. In addition, these presentations must be improved or extended to not only cover healthy relationships and consent as they do now, but also to provide a detailed plan on how to get help at school if one has been sexually assaulted. I encourage the school district to collaborate more with the Rape Crisis Center to not only educate students, but staff as well. Secondly, because not every staff member or police officer is able to fully grasp what a victim has been through and may intentionally or unintentionally downplay their experience, it is imperative that schools share the steps for filing a Title IX complaint with students. Sometimes due to lack of response from administrators, a Title IX complaint is the only way a student is able to feel that they can obtain justice from such a traumatic experience. While I understand that this puts your federal funding at risk, this also ensures that you are creating a safe and welcoming experience for every student by being forced to take appropriate action following the Title IX complaint. As I finish off my last year at Memorial, I can only hope that the next generation of MMSD students will be able to attend safer schools and receive an appropriate response from staff when in need of help. I ask you to consider more training, collaboration, and education in making this happen. Thank you. Hi everyone. I wanted to start off by thanking you all for your statement at the beginning of the meeting. My name is Anika Samuel and my pronouns are she for hers. I'm a sophomore at James Madison Memorial High School right now. I'm here to talk to you guys today about sexual assault and harassment within our district. In my two years at JMI, I've experienced and seen catcalls or other objectifying comments in the hallways. Heard stories about reported <coughs> sexual assaults and rapes that still wait to see justice. Or most unfortunately, heard stories about unreported sexual assaults and rapes because victims didn't either know how to report or didn't feel empowered to. In conversations I've had with my peers, Many of them have them justified sexual assaults and harassment with comments like, boys will be boys, or they're just kids, what do you expect? I cannot properly convey how sickening and frightening these comments are to me as a student of MSD. After hearing about what happened at least, I was originally infuriated by the reaction of this school. However, as I became more aware of the changes they had made, I grew hopeful of the prospect of implementing them in my own. Unfortunately, it seems that district-wide changes are still awaited. But the fact is, it shouldn't take a sexual assault for us to wake up and realize that assault and harassment happen. It's imperative that around the district and in our own schools, we take the voice of students seriously. In addition to providing more education on a district level about rape culture and how to handle sexual harassment and assault, we need to educate our students about their Title IX rights. Furthermore, we've sent you a list of policies, suggestions, after reviewing the district's way that they handle this. For, we believe that, firstly, the district should enable victims to request that the instigator of assaults changes schools upon return from expulsion. Attending the same school as the perpetrator causes undue emotional damage to the victim. We also believe that the district should accept claims of sexual assault and harassment regardless of how many days after this incident has happened. Every claim of sexual harassment, regardless of when it is filed, should be taken seriously and should merit an investigation. We hope that we will be able to work with the board and the schools to help create a truly equitable and safe MMSD for all. Thank you so much for your time and consideration, and we hope to hear from you soon. Hi everyone, um, my name is Maggie DeSanza. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a sophomore at Memorial High School. Um, I want to thank you for the statement that you made earlier. However, I do want to talk about how throughout my time at Memorial, I have seen a multitude of catcalls and harassing gestures in the hallways, heard far too many rape jokes to count, and witnessed vic victims of sexual assault feel helpless and alone. 
And yet I have seen no action against such a dehumanizing crime from our school's administration. After being made aware of the recent events at East High School, it is apparent to me that these horrifying occurrences of sexual violence happen daily, and we are doing little to support the victims involved or prevent it from happening in the first place. But there are ways to create safe and inclusive spaces for everyone in our district, and truly make certain that sexual assault is no longer a common happenstance. For one, we need to make sure that we support and believe victims who are strong enough to come forward about their assault. Currently, our district does not want to be held accountable for sexual assaults that happen in our schools, hence their earlier statements explaining that kids will be kids and that these incidences are going to happen. These are unacceptable responses, and despite apologizing for the notion of the phrases, no action has been taken in order to get just compensation for the victim. Next, we need to support victims who are uncertain about coming forward. We must make it clear where victims can report to and how to do so. At the moment, there is little information provided for students that gives them the knowledge of who and where they can report harassment or assault. In addition to, students, to giving students the freedom to report their experiences, we must comply with their requests. This meaning removing their perpetrator from any classes, supporting them with counseling, and providing safe spaces at schools. Finally, we desperately need education about rape culture and consent at the middle and high school level. There is little to no education about sexual assault and its negative consequences in current health classes. This must change. A comprehensive curriculum should be required for all middle and high school students to learn about rape culture and consent. As I continue my schooling at Memorial, I hope to see legitimate change take place so I no longer have to witness or hear about sexual assault and harassment in our hallways. We thank you very much for listening and hope to hear back from you about creating a more safe district for all students. Hi, my name is Rebecca Cutforth. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a junior at Memorial. Tonight, you have heard many young women explain that our district is failing them. Our policies on sexual assault and harassment are glaringly inadequate, and these inadequacies are hurting students every day. I know that you and Madison as a whole want to prevent sexual assault and harassment. Unfortunately, problems are easier to acknowledge than to fix. We are here because students are sick of inaction. For real change to happen in our schools, you need to take the time to write and approve policies. Sexual harassment and assaults are real problems and should be treated as such. You need to put sexual harassment, including verbal harassment, in the behavior education plan. You need to publicize which faculty members hear harassment and assault claims and how to reach them. You also need to add education on sexual harassment, sexual assaults, and consent into middle and high school health classes. East High School is already partnering with the Rape Crisis Center to educate students. This could easily be expanded across the district. These actions would give students much needed channels to express their concerns. You also need to develop guidelines to protect victims who do come forward. I have had friends bravely report harassment to counselors, yet still be forced to go to class with their harassers every day. Because of this, they were scared to attend school. This is unacceptable. MMSD has a responsibility to keep all students on school grounds safe. Again, I urge you to look at this problem seriously. We have sent you our detailed policy requests, which I encourage you to look at. We hope that we can work with you to make our district safe and equitable for all. Thank you so much for your time, and we hope to hear from you soon. My name is Mike Hall and I'm a youth leader at Freedom Inc. I'm here today to talk about the history of the police. We all know that the police aren't here to protect us. Police was created to be slave catchers. They were there to catch black and brown slaves that to escape from the owners. Black and brown kids are harassed from the police at school and even at, out of in the streets. Having police in schools disrupt our way of learning. 
Safety it doesn't exist if black and brown students are getting forced to interact with police that threaten them and not see them as humans. The foundation that the police in institution was built on was to continue to be ra racial profiling of black and brown people. There isn't a reasonable fact on how or why police need to be in schools. We're, we have seen the police use force for minor offenses, like when we ask students supposed, supposedly being disruptive. But if you cared enough about black and brown students, then you would ask them how you as adults can be supportive. We as students are here to learn, then why take our education away from us by taking us to jail for some dumb reasons? We as students are here to get from we are we as students aren't here to get arrested we are here because we t we were taught that education was what we needed in life police don't belong in schools they belong in prisons and having police in schools is basically turning schools into prisons you might decide on keeping cops in schools but i'll continue to keep you coming here so that my demands and what i want can stick into your minds <clears throat> Not just that, but when you guys think about my words to have my image pop in your heads. Before ending my testimony, let me share a quick story that I read because something really little thing led him or her to action scene. In Birmingham, Alabama, a black high school student was assaulted by a school resource officer for wearing a hat indoors. Instead of telling this kid to take his hat off, Instead, the officers turned the kid to him and punched him in the head and grabbed him and started choking him. This is not okay and this is not what you call safety. We demand for one, completely removing police from our four high schools. Second, create opportunities for students, families, and communities to have power to make real decisions about school, and finally, invest resource in education that promotes leadership, wellness, learning, and creativity for youth of color. Thank you. We told you all over and over again that cops make us feel unsafe. Yet again, you felt us. What don't y'all get? When I was in high school, cops never made me feel safe, never will I ever have a relationship with an ERO. I've been racially profiled many times for walking black. I would never feel safe with cops in schools, with cops in schools. We have three demands. First, we don't want cops in schools. We want them out of a so-called safe place. Second, invest into youth of color and not cops. So the $360,000 that will be going into the cops can invest into Freedom Inc. so we can train some of the folks to understand what's going on. Last, community control over school safety. Let the youth of color have control over restorative justice circles, including suspending them and taking them away from school. You are upholding white supremacy. By keeping them in schools, you are doing the same thing that the white folks, that the white folks in the police were doing in the 40s. They only put police in schools so they could keep black and brown youth out of schools and for them to feel uncomfortable. And that's exactly what you are doing if you all are keeping them in schools. We, want, we do not want the cops that are trained to shoot first and ask questions later. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Stacey Reese, and I'm the Sustainability Program Coordinator for the City of Madison. And I'm here to show my support, representing myself, showing the support of adopting a resolution to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2040. You will be joining the city of Madison, the city of Middleton, the city of Fitchburg, the city of Monona, and over 100 other communities who have also passed similar resolutions. 
You also have the support beyond the uh, community organizations that are fighting against climate change. You have the support of parents. You have the support of students. And I will be submitting to you um, part of the petition for the campaign for 100% renewable. Almost 2,500 signatures and over 2,000 of them were students. Climate change is real. It's the greatest threat that we have for our children's future. And by adopting this resolution, you're showing the leadership to take action. So with that, uh, I want to thank you again uh, for passing the resolution. We're all in this together, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Sorry, I missed March. I missed your faces. Um, I quoted Cesar Chavez. So, um, so at that last meeting, I did not think this would happen, that we're here at Cesar Chavez. Um, and this is a school that is uh, named after a Chicano activist who represented a very radical movement that actually sparked solidarity between Chicano and Asian, particularly Filipino workers. So I feel like that's really important to acknowledge because Freedom Inc.'s campaign represents solidarity and unity and, uh, and a really radical fight against white supremacy and racism, similar to, the, um, similar to the boycott in California at the time and, rep and has a lot of, uh, in, his, in the campaign is compromised by black and Southeast Asian youth and they're fighting for their right to a police-free education. Having police in schools continues the school-to-prison pipeline. It doesn't matter if the individual cops are nice, it doesn't matter if they're good with the kids, it matters that police are an institution which has historical roots in the slave patrol. So many practices reflect that history, and it is important to acknowledge that when you have police in schools, you're continuing the school-to-prison pipeline. Um, Police exist for white people. Police only exist for white people. Police do not exist for people of color, especially not youth of color. Children ages 12 to 18 are in, the most, in one of the most significant times in their lives developmentally. There's a lot going on there. Um, the last thing we need are police and schools reinforcing white supremacy in the school to prison pipeline, especially in Madison where disparities are very high. Um, since I'm sick, I'm going to need the audience's help in reciting the three freedom ink demands. Okay. What's the first one? No cops in school. school. Second one? Uh, rest in color. <laughs> okay. And number three? Community control. All right, that was kind of weak, y'all. We're gonna have to start it over. What's number one? No cops in school. Number two? supremacy and the status quo, and uh, you all have the power to subvert that. I'm sorry, I'm usually much louder, but uh, I can't be right now, but um, like I said, you have the power to subvert white supremacy and the status quo, and remember, it's not about the grapes, it's about the people. Drive, drive while black when too many police 
is excessive force against an innocent black men. When black kids in white schools here in Dane County get threatened to not walk black or talk black, not to mention all the hurts from more subtle barbs, it's wonderful to see so many more new faces and fresh faces and new divergent points of view. My name is Peter Anderson. I have four kids, now adults who went to the district, and now I have two grandkids at Franklin, and it's a wonderful experience they're having here. But I am extraordinarily disturbed and worried about the future of this district because its failure to confront the internal contradictions and the self-destructive actions is taken, I'm speaking here about the White Horse middle school incident, and then I'm gonna lead into, as much time as I have, the inability to work with people like Colleen Care to bring in things like urban prep, which might actually be able to deal with some of the problems of present school system. The fact that we had this enormous victory, I'm sure you understand this yourself, it's so exciting to have that victory, but the real task that's so much harder than that one that the ballot box is actually achieving the goals you want to achieve. So it is a good thing that the district has programs that relate, attempt to relate to kids with behavior issues, grow down of problems at home, and implicit racism in the schools. It's a credit to the district that a set of programs have trained positive behavior coaches in an effort to manage disruption in a way that does not bring in the police, because I agree that's the last thing you want to have. And it's also a very good thing that kids with complaints about racism by the teachers are seriously heard. But on the other hand, when a, 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 a allegation is made and the person against whom the allegation is made is never even given a hearing, the message you send is completely dysfunctional to what you want to achieve. Um, I don't think I ever can understand how this could proceed in Madison or in America, where someone accused with a long record in this community and in this school district is made in charge and is not an investigation. He's just assumed to be guilty and he's called horrific. This, I think we need to understand is if there are behavioral issues in the schools and we tell people who volunteer for these positions and work hard and train that any allegations made, you will not even have a chance to be heard. You're just going to be having your career ruined. No one is going to step up. And I am uh, sorry I ran out of time. I do have a written time. And I'd be glad to share with you. And I would like to continue this conversation. Thank you. We'll be Worthy, and I'm a mental health social worker in Madison from Journey Mental Health. Um, I wanted to take uh, my time today to share how proud I am of the Freedom Inc. Youth Squad and to highlight their incredible leadership in the No Cops in School campaign. Um, I think it was Bianca from Freedom Inc. who said, and I'm paraphrasing, um, but if these students were white, they would be receiving accolades on accolades for their ability to organize the Madison community around an issue that directly affects them, their peers, and their community. They've studied policy, they've studied movement history, they've studied the school board budget, they've attended every single school board meeting for over two years and created a whole coalition. Like, I don't know if the community really knows about that, you know, because that's not what the media has portrayed them out to be, right? Um, they've even received a personal shout out from Angela Davis herself. Right? <laughs> Saying that she's heard about their campaign due to the national attention they received for their incredible leadership. And when the youth asked if she had any advice, Dr. Davis said that she didn't have anything to add because they were already doing the work. <laughs> Yet the media has portrayed them as a dangerous and aggressive minority, not as the incredible activists they are. So thank you again, Freedom Inc. Thank you for bringing this to the forefront of the community's attention. Thank you for making this a school board election issue. 
and I look forward to seeing how the new school board members support um, this movement to get cops out of school. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Drew. I'm a mental health social worker from Madison, and I'm here in solidarity with Freedom Inc. and their efforts to keep cops out of schools. Having worked with in the mental health field the past several years, I have a pretty good understanding as to how mental, those with mental illness are treated by cops and the institution of imprisonment in this country. A person with mental illness is 16 times more likely to be murdered by a cop. It should not be surprising to hear that many of those I work with in my day to day are kind of terrified of cops. A lot of these experiences my clients have stem from experiences at a very early age. Students with mental illness and disability in general are much more likely to be referred to cops and arrested than other students. The students of Freedom Inc. have done an amazing job illustrating how cops in schools disproportionately treat students of color. Please listen to these students and their concerns. There are better ways to use resources and funds in a school than putting those resources and funds towards an institution that has helped to perpetuate a racial and socioeconomic underclass since day one. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, congratulations to all the new school board members, it's great to see you up there. My name is Lori Herkes Dwyer and I'm the Executive Director at the Dane County Time Bank. Um, first I want to express support to Freedom Inc. for their leadership and I support the demands that they have going in this campaign. I recently attended a panel put on by community members talking about the district's policies and practices around the use of restraints in schools. Dr. Jasmine Zapata was on the panel and she brought a much needed medical perspective to the conversation. She talked about the impact that trauma and toxic stress have on a child's brain. She also argued that the school environment is causing trauma and toxic stress for students of color and more specifically for our black students. True restorative justice is grounded in the belief that all people are interconnected and worthy. In this room tonight, we're hearing about tremendous harm. If we as a district are promoting restorative practices, a restorative mindset must be used everywhere, including here. If we wanna transform our students, staff, and in our schools, we need, you need to ask yourselves the three fundamental questions of restorative justice. What harm is being caused and to whom? What are the needs and obligations of the people involved? And how should all the people affected work towards repairing the harms? The answers to these questions should be reflected in your policies and in your budget. As a community partner of the district, I've seen some amazing restorative justice practitioners within MMSD staff. I've seen some beautiful and powerful moments of connection and growth for youth and adults alike. I've seen transformation. I've also seen staff sent to, I've also seen staff do restorative justice without the skills, understanding, or prep work to be able to make sure that it's successful. They're, sometimes they're attempting to use it in response to an incident, but under these circumstances, restorative justice can actually do more harm. Restorative justice can't be forced and it shouldn't be used as positive punishment. Restorative justice is not the same as a diversionary practice. Restorative justice is much more than youth accountability. This work takes time, vulnerability, and a tremendous amount of care and love. It's not something that you can add on to someone's plate and expect that it goes well. Restorative justice is about community building, it's about supporting one another, it's about trust, respect, and being accountable to one another. It's about ensuring that everyone's voice is heard. I'd like to encourage you to broaden your view of restorative justice to include the proactive community building work. That's the work that's necessary to shift from crisis response culture to a true restorative and strengths-based culture that values all people within a building. Healthy communities is what increases safety. Please invest in building them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Don Ferber. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of the 100% Renewable Energy Resolution the school board hopefully will adopt tonight. Uh, I want to speak to it, even though I'm an energy advocate, not just simply on the issue of energy and climate change, but you've been hearing a lot about empowerment tonight. And this, we are here at this point with this resolution 
because we have students who have felt empowered to bring it to this point and realize it's their future. And so in moving forward, to the extent possible, and I realize there may be constraints here, I want you to look at this as an opportunity to continue to empower these students. There will be a lot of decisions that will need to be made in terms of money, what is done where, how it's done, who is involved. And so maybe this is an educational opportunity to keep the students involved in this, to let them participate in this process, in the decisions, in what happens, and perhaps even in some of the work that needs to be done here. After all, it's their future. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Laura Schmidt-Dolan. I am a bilingual elementary school teacher at um, Lowell, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> Lincoln. My daughter went to Lowell. I'm also the mother of a freshman at East High School. On April 5th, I received a notice or an email from Principal Hernandez um, talking about a incident of a student bringing a knife to school. Uh, a couple days later, I received another notice of an incident at school that involved bringing a gun to school. Um, it was dealt with by staff and by the ERO that was on um, staff there. Her name is uh, Zulma Franco. Uh, a few days later, my daughter texted me and said, did you hear what happened? And I said, yes, I had gotten the notice that a sexual assault, and actually it was a gang rape, because she was raped by more than one person, in the bathroom at 4 p.m., when there were many students at school, my daughter's at school with track, um, and wanted to know if I had heard about it. And I said, yes, I did. Um, the next day, I was expecting that the staff would have had some kind of prepared statement to, to address that with the students, that they would all be on the same page. I talked to several staff members, nothing had happened. Um, a couple days later, we get a response from downtown, um, from the head of security, using some words that I think most people found to say, that's part of the problem. Kids will not be kids. That is not what the community expected to hear. The, excuse, the community expected to hear, we will have zero tolerance for sexual violence in our schools. We don't know how this affected those who are rape survivors, whose parents are rape survivors, whose siblings are rape survivors. I mean, we have to have an unconditional support for victims and a message that will say that we will not tolerate sexual violence, sexual harassment of students, sexual harassment of staff. I have staff at East High School, friends and colleagues saying, we don't feel safe. We don't feel safe, we don't feel listened to. We don't feel supported. And I would like to point out, and I appreciate very much Freedom Inc. being here, but I would also like to take a step back and say, are our ERO's doing anything positive in schools? Who did the victim report to? She reported, she reported it, I just want to say that she reported it, she felt safe enough to report it to the ERO. So I would like people to just think, are there anything positive that our ERO is doing? Do we hear about those things? Exceptions to the rules. I'm, I'm asking what's specific here to Madison, what's going on in our community. So no, I Excuse me, could you just let her finish her, her comments? No, I appreciate, I mean, I I know I appreciate that I do. Um, so I just want to take a step back and ask: Are there anything positive? And that's what I'll leave you with. Thank you. My name is Sunny McDaniel and I'm a parent at Lowell Elementary where our staff of six special education assistants and three cross-categorical teachers estimates that they are currently unable to fulfill 25 hours each week of legally required minutes of specially designed instructions as outlined in students' IEPs. The district proudly called out a $1.5 million increase in special education and student support staffing in the budget workbook for next year, yet Lowell's staffing allocation in these areas was cut by 30%. Lowell's highest need students will return next year and our overall special education student number looks to remain the same. This means that the 25 hours of currently unmet requirements for SDIs will significantly increase as we'll have two and a half cross-categorical cross teachers and three SEAs to serve 18 classrooms. 
I'm disappointed by the district's contradictory reduction of crucial resources in this important area, which makes Lowell less safe, less welcoming, less educational, and less just for all students and teachers. Everyone in the classroom suffers when the children who need help don't get it. I'd like more information on how the district monitors compliance with federal law in this area and how it plans to ensure that each student receives each school receives sufficient staffing allocations to educate all students in a fair, safe, and inclusive environment. Staff allocations need to be based on actual minutes of need, not merely headcounts and ratios. And we need to stop putting teachers in the legal, moral, and ethical position where they are forced daily to choose which students' needs will go unmet. I implore the board and the district to act immediately on this issue to ensure that all of our children get what they need each and every day without putting students and teachers into a compromised position. Thanks. So after um, being there in the room with the youth um, and appreciating their leadership, I went home and I listened to um, the YouTube posting for all of you who were in the back room. Uh, and I listened to it twice. And I was thinking about the conversation that you were having with each other. I was thinking about it in two different ways. One was a conversation that you were having with each other that seemed like it necessitated more conversations outside of the school board meeting. There are other things that were being talked about that seemed like there were not due diligence that were coming out in a policy or in a, in a, in a place for making rules and regulations that need to be shored off and like dealt with elsewhere. The other thing that I was noticing is I saw three different themes that come up, I think, routinely in meetings uh, around um, policing and around resources. One of those things is still this argument that um, behavioral issues necessitate an officer in schools. I don't know why that's still an argument that's coming up, given all the data that you have. Um, I also saw an argument coming up that, given that data, you still need to go with the gut, which I don't know how that's an argument that's still coming up either. But the one that hurt the most to listen to uh, was the argument that the officers that you have are good people. I was raised a Catholic. If before the death of Mother Teresa, she were to come in and apply for an ERO position, I would say, please, please, school board, do not hire the most holy, the most service-oriented. The ERO position is not a position for schools. There is nothing an officer on site in a school can do for our children that is better, that would be done better and with less harm than another staff person. So I don't know why we're still having this conversation. Get cops out of schools. Right. And if you need more power from people to have your back in making that choice, which seems to be stalled by a kind of fear that I'm not quite sure, like what else do you need from us? What else do you need from the young people that are coming every month to see you? Get cops out of schools. Invest in youth of color. Give community control over the kind of safety that exists in our schools. And they are already telling you what that safety looks like. So all you need to do is listen. $360,000 annual contract between MMSD and MPD. We want the removal of police officers from the schools, true community governance and decision making for the resources allocated in schools, and the building of an infrastructure and a climate of transformative justice instead of punishing youth. Time and time again, we hear from the superintendent and from members on this board and staff that we must do better is usually what we hear. Um, 
And then what we usually will hear then is pub this public comment period that we're in where community members, mostly black and brown youth, and folks who actually attend the schools are offering the school board these very specific and direct ways uh, that MMSD can and indeed must do better. And so what I wonder is why is it taken this long you know, for these policy changes to increase the access and the quality of a public school education for black and brown youth? Have we so quickly forgotten this disparate and inequitable public educational environment that the Race to Equity report five years ago plainly revealed to our mostly white community and decision makers here in Dade County? So what we need are healthy meals and snacks, subsidized bus passes, hiring and retaining more black and brown social workers and counselors. These are just some of the many ideas that have been put forth by black and brown youth um, and adults who care about youth about how we really can do better. And we do that by reinvesting taxpayer dollars into resources that promote youth of color leadership, their wellness, their learning and creativity options. These investments, they don't require new taxpayer ones. And yet, these are the innovative and straightforward approaches that the youth, the users of these services, are actually approaching for new school safety and wellness ideas. So again, we see cops are still in schools. They're not helping youth of color graduate with pride or with self-worth or with safety. They're not preventing shootings or incidences of sexual assault from happening or from Rob Mueller Owens from losing his mind on a young black woman in schools as well. So what I ask is, you know, if not now, when? And if not you all, then who? There's been a lot of cause for optimism for new school board, mem school board members being on this body and the idea that you all are gonna actually work as a collective unit to enact these policy changes that are more equitable for youth of color. So I would say don't waste too much time and make the motion to end this contract to make sure that youth of color and all youth in general can have the environment that they need to thrive and instead of just surviving, but actually thriving in schools. How much time do I have? Go ahead. So yes, and, and again, what we are hopeful and are optimistic is that we can more than just come in front of you all for three minutes at a time. Um, and instead of just having our words be filtered and gate kept out of the opportunity for them to be passed in policy. So uh, support youth and families to have control over decision making and just keep in mind what's going to be different about this year's school board than it has in the past. So thank you. talked about recently was that with the two-year campaign um, school safety especially for youth of color became a huge talking point right and I know that um, the new school board members supported youth of color right and so I really hope to see that happen in actual policy actions um, going forward um, because obviously with our school district um, with the incidents like ha that has been mentioned with White Horse, um, violence against a young black girl, we expect, we, we hear about police violence, but for our own school staff members who are supposed to be trained to be working with our young people, um, committing this violence, and those uh, who are trained and boast their um, restorative justice training, um, that's ridiculous that they're the ones committing the violence. Uh, so, yeah, and then I also wanted to address a point about, if we're speaking about safety, um, and as has been brought uh, from other, another speaker, um, why, are we, why are we finding safety in an institution that uses violence, incarceration, and ec economic harm through ticketing um, to have safety in our schools, right? Um, so, 
and we should and all these points have already been made. We should just be investing in uh, other staff who are are well trained. And no training for again the uh, institution that uses violence, incarceration, and economic harm will will make them you know softer and nicer. Um, wearing uh, civilian clothing will make them any any nicer, right? Um, the the numbers will still be the same. The violence will still be the same. Um, there, it's rooted in history, and it will continue to be that way because white supremacy is real and it happens, and it, we need to have actual actions, policies that will fight it. Um, and I really hope that now that the community is is very aware of the discourse that's happening in our schools and um, in the policy discourse that's happening, that you all uh, respond accordingly to what the community wants, which is to uh, take cops off school, uh, invest in youth of color, and give communities control over schools and police. Thank you. for the operation and development of the Wisconsin School Resource Officers Association. During that time, I worked with PLSOs and SROs from around the state to provide resources and training to police officers and deputies working in schools. One of the things that we tried to do as an organization was to get a handle on this branch of law enforcement. We wanted to know how many SROs are there in the state? How are they paid? How long do they typically stay in schools? What are the policies? But we couldn't get that information. And that's because nobody in the state tracks that information. The DPI has no idea how many SROs there are. The, the, the Sheriff's Association has no idea. The Police Chiefs Association, no idea. We don't have that information. Every school district, Every municipality handles it differently, and there's no data about those things. So there, and even more importantly, there is no data about effectiveness. So fast forward, you know, seven years of me doing other stuff and waking up. Um, and I, I asked the school board to think about the data that we do have. The data we do have is that children of color view police officers very differently than white children. White children see them as people to go to if they're scared, hurt, or afraid. Black children see them as the people who make them scared, hurt, and afraid. Children of color are disproportionately negatively impacted by interactions with SROs in schools. Disabled children are disproportionately negatively impacted by interactions with SROs in schools. These, all of these statements are supported by data. Children that have early interactions with law enforcement are much more likely to have later interactions with law enforcement. Interactions with law enforcement in schools feeds the school to prison pipeline. Many children that act out are survivors of trauma and continuing to undergo trauma, undergo, undergo childhood traumas. The best way to address trauma <coughs> is through a comprehensive approach to trauma-informed care. MPD makes all the decisions about who can work in the schools without concern for specialized training experience or suitability to working with kids. And we have a police department that should be responsive to situations within our school. They don't have to be there. We should be able to pick up the phone and call them if please, we have a problem. Please finish up. So I ask you, my belief is there's no such thing as a disposable child. Every student deserves all that we have to give. And I hope that you will stop spending money on feeding the school to prison pipeline and instead focus those dollars on the kids that need intervention the most. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sandra Watkins. 
things. And what I want to talk to you about, you guys play this extremely full. And I'm going to say it's extremely full because we're missing the big picture here. This is an institution of learning. And people that look like me haven't been learning for a long time. And I, my oldest daughter that went to school in this district is 45. My youngest is 38. And I've got grandkids that came to this school here. And we're still hearing the same thing, the achievement gap. Why do we still have the achievement gap? Why are we still working on that same problem? You guys, this district is notorious for banning everything, but nothing gets fixed. When is that going to stop? Why aren't kids achieving? Whether they started in this district and fell off, a lot of kids misbehave and aren't achieving because they don't know the material. And that, that says a lot about this district. Why don't they know the material? And if they came from somewhere else, why are we constantly passing them off? Because you keep pushing them on in elementary school, middle school, then it becomes a problem. They can't function. That's why they're acting out. And you guys keep band-aiding up. We're still having professional development. A couple of weeks ago, I said in one, where we're gonna talk about why we shouldn't be using the N word. And we get a, a, the morning for PD for this. We've been oppressed for 400 years and you give a half of a morning to talk about an issue? That's just not okay. Not at all. Enough is enough. I don't know how you guys are gonna manage it. I don't even wanna be in your shoes. But our eyes are on all you females right now. Yes, ma'am, they are. Because enough is enough. There's a lot going on, and there's a lot people want to see you guys do. What I want you guys, the big one is I want to see achievement for brown skinned kids. That's what I want to see right now. Accelerated. And I want to see why are we still having racial discussions. I'm still being, I get discriminated in my own school where I work. Women don't even speak to me, come in the classroom, don't even acknowledge me. Why are we still having conversations? Why do Caucasian teachers have to be trained how to interact with African American kids? We don't get to train how to interact with y'all. How about let's treat everybody like a human being? We all bleed the same color. We all want the same thing, respect and love. Hi, I'm Heather Driscoll, and uh, first of all, I want to say congratulations to all the new school board members. I'm so excited to see you up here. And, uh, oh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm speaking um, on behalf of uh, opposing the school resource officer contract. Uh, and the reasoning, you know, I spoke previously about my daughter is a student at Lowell. And I can attest to what Sunny was talking about with the staffing cuts. And it's affecting all students. Um, like I had said previously, there's a shortage of counselors we're not currently meeting the ratio with the school district. Um, so that's one area why I think the money that's spent on the school resource officers would be better spent on mental health um, resources instead of staff members. And then another thing I wanna talk about is uh, most of my work in the community, I've been doing a lot of work on gun violence prevention. And I heard some people say that school resource, resource officers will stop school shootings, but there's very little evidence to show that that is in fact true. In fact, there was a school resource officer at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, and they did not prevent the school shooting from happening. But what we, and what we do know is that black and brown students are unfairly targeted and arrested um, at much higher rates than white students, and so I really think that that is not making our schools safer. And then another area I'm working on is um, renewable energy, and I'm really excited uh, that it's 
it appears that the school board is going to be adopting a resolution for 100% renewable energy. And I think this is a really smart move in investing in the youth and protecting our children's future. And I also want you to think about uh, protecting our children's future today and what's happening in the schools. Because uh, right now, the lived experiences of many of the students in the schools is that they're scared by the school resource officers and they don't feel safe. And so um, I want you to consider that too. Uh, so that's it, thank you. Okay, so that ends our public appearances for this evening. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next on the agenda are the uh, news from around the district. And so I will be leading off, and then we have um, statements, uh, resolutions that will be read uh, by Ananda and, and Nikki. So uh, the first is uh, just with the start of spring comes opportunities for renewal, restoration, and new beginnings for many facets of life. And the school board is no exception. Today we officially welcome three new members to the school board, Ali, Ananda, and Chris. Their addition marks the first all-female school board in the history of this school district and a renewed commitment to the vision and goals that we have established as a community. Today also marks the beginning of a new concerted effort to being in the community with those that we serve. In the coming months, the school board will continue to host its regular monthly meetings at Madison schools across the district as a means to increase access and to strengthen our connection to the community. Thank you to Chavez for being the first and very welcoming host. To gain greater insight into our work, board members will also be visiting more schools throughout May to engage more closely with students and staff and their everyday experiences. And in the coming weeks, board members will also be connecting with key staff and community groups to further deepen our insights. As a board, we commit to sharing our insights and lessons learned from these experiences at our May and June meetings. More importantly, we commit to continuing to deepen our engagement now and moving forward. Uh, Ananda? I know where the button is. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm really proud to be reading this resolution tonight. Where is the city of Madison and Fitchburg and the county of Dean and other communities within the Madison Metropolitan School District service area have passed various resolutions and set goals in support of mitigation, mitigating climate change, and where is students, faculty, administrators, and board members in the district have also expressed their support for an active role by the district in mitigating climate change and whereas increased energy efficiency in district buildings and increased use of renewable energy sources such as solar and wind will not only increase the environmental sustainability of the district, but could be economically beneficial to the district. Now therefore be it resolved that the district build into the 2019 long range facility plan consideration for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects to begin as soon as possible. Be it further resolved that the District Building Service Department would continue to devote staff time to develop and implement a plan to meet this goal. Be it further resolved that the district identify grants and other external funding resources to assist in our efforts to install solar plant panels and implement major energy efficiency improvements beginning in 2019. And be it further resolved that the district develop a strategy and timetable time for additional energy efficiency and renewable energy projects based on the recommendations and use of area subject matters. And be it further resolved that the district board establish goals to meet 50% of all district operations energy needs with renewable energy by 2030, 75% by 2035, and 100% by 2040. Whereas, Governor
Governor Tony Evers proposed his biennial, biennial state budget for 2021. And whereas public education is the foundation of strong communities and states, and whereas Wisconsin citizens have demonstrated the priority and commitment they place on strong public education and call on state government to support public schools. And whereas the, and the governor's proposal includes strong support for public schools, including fair funding for our future, fully funding four-year-old kindergarten, increasing mental health supports, summer schools, and more. And whereas the governor's proposal includes a substantive and overdue focus on special education, which has not had an increase in 10 years, addition by <laughs> speaker. And whereas the governor's proposal focuses on supporting and functioning the state's public schools instead of diverting taxpayer resources <coughs> to private and charter schools. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Madison Metropolitan School District Board of Education joins public schools across the state in urging our state legislators to support proposals of this budget and come together to support strong public schools. And I thank Madam President for allowing me to give this statement. As an individual with disabilities, I feel that this is a step in the right direction for this board, and I thank you for that opportunity. Okay, next on the agenda is the superintendent's announcements and reports. So, Jen, I will hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Mary. I'm going to have a couple members of our team approach the podium. Kelly Rubel, our chief financial officer, and Lisa Quistad, who is the head of teaching and learning. Um, and we're going to use this time to give you a quick presentation on the draft preliminary budget, um, which was published just on Friday. Um, I do want to take this opportunity to extend a special welcome to our new board members. Lovely to have you here. Um, each year, um, as you know, we strive to create a budget proposal that tightly aligns with the priorities of the school district. Um, budget should be a reflection of those priorities. Um, and this year is no different, but this is the first uh, time that we got to align a budget to our new strategic framework, um, which does make a difference. Tonight, we want to walk you just through the major highlights of the budget proposal. Um, there, we have a no new news policy when it comes uh, to the release of this draft preliminary budget, so bear with me. What you're going to be hearing about should be something you've heard about before. That's the point. Um, we are really excited. We think it is a positive proposal, but most importantly, we think it uh, provides the board with a strong foundation from which to deliberate, which is what you'll be doing for the next couple of months. Um, for us, this presentation is, serves as like the uh, official handoff between the staff who have been working on putting together the draft these uh, past six months um, to the board for uh, deep deliberation, additional public input, um, an opportunity for you to make amendments to the budget before it gets finally approved. And again, that's approval of the preliminary budget at the end of June. Um, so let me walk you through a little uh, Kind of front matter. I don't know where the clicker is. Do you have a count? Okay. Um, as I already said, we've been working on um, aligning our budget to the new strategic framework, which was launched this fall. Thank you, Kelly. Um, that framework, as you know, because you approved it, is aligned to a vision statement, um, which we take very seriously. We want to make sure that every school is a thriving school, um, and that means students and adults together thriving. Um, to prepare every student for college, career, and community. Um, the budget should be aligned to the core values that the board approved this past year. Um, these core values include belonging, excellence, creativity, racial equity, and social justice, voice, and focus. Um, and we believe the proposal that you'll see tonight um, you know, can be held up to, to that set of core values. Um, it's also aligned with a set of goals um, uh, and metrics by which we measure progress for, towards those goals um, and we hold ourselves annual account, annually accountable um, to making that kind of progress. 
Finally, um, it enables us to put into action, the budget does, the strategy we've outlined for meeting those goals. Um, and kind of the high level description of those strategies are here. Um, especially our priorities uh, as outlined in the strategic framework for uh, uh, making sure that every student is experiencing uh, deeper learning, right? Deep and rich learning experiences. We want to make sure that our budget is supporting that priority. We want to make sure that the budget is uh, supporting our desire to foster safe and thriving cultures and climates. And we want to make sure that it's helping us expand opportunities for students to become prepared for the post-secondary option of their choice. Um, go to the next one. I do, I, I said this in our last uh, operations work group meeting, but I want to remind everyone that the budget, while aligned to the framework, certainly does not uh, acknowledge every single strategy we are enacting, because every single strategy um, doesn't require new major budget investments. We work hard to um, take a close look at the budget every year, realign it to make sure that we can enact our strategy as a whole. What you're going to be seeing tonight are the kind of small subset of strategies that require new significant budget investments. Um, so we'll be highlighting that shortly. So I'll pass it over to Kelly. Um, I do need to acknowledge this is Kelly's first draft preliminary budget um, as our chief financial officer. So Kelly, major shout out to you. The fact that this beautiful document that's sitting in front of everyone is a feat in and of itself. So I'll let you say a few words about it. All right. Strategic framework, mission, values, and goals in mind. We officially launched our budget process in January and set out to complete each of the steps you see in this slide. With the release of our draft preliminary budget tonight, we have successfully accomplished this first phase with a positive, balanced budget that aligns our resources to this new strategy and invests in students who need it the most. In January, we agreed to a set of budget goals and guiding principles. We have successfully met the goals we set out for ourselves, and we have successfully operated within the guiding principles you gave to us. We started the budget process by looking at our revenue. Without an approved state budget, we will continue to work based on a set of assumptions. Using state history and the known political climate, we made some assumptions about our maximum revenue authority this year. This slide is a picture of our per pupil revenue trend over time. As you can see, regardless of the governor or the tools being used, we received a revenue between $100 and $200 of per pupil increase for the last 10 years. This then is what we build on for the 1920 budget. We've assumed that we would receive at least $100 per pupil and revenue limit increase. While this would only produce $2.7 million in new revenue, we are thankful to have the 2016 referendum authority from our community available to us. Together, we are estimating $10.7 million in new revenue this year. In addition, the district will benefit from additional to 25 funding from the City of Madison to continue the one-time investments agreed to in 2016. While we would always like to have more resources, the funding from local taxpayers has allowed us to make a number of investments that will move the district forward. An item for the board to continue to watch in upcoming years is our district's three-year membership results shown on the screen above. This is the student count the Department of Public Instruction uses to determine our overall revenue limit. While the three-year average is looking stable for revenue collection, Looking at the red bar in the chart, these are the 2X or independent charter school student enrollment counts. At most, we will receive 33% of the revenue for each new 2X or independent charter enrolled student, while we have a corresponding 100% expense that we must pay for each of those students. Therefore, the non-MMSD students in red are tied to revenues that cannot be used to fund district operations. Because our student in C counts is slightly declining, we did need to make an overall reduction in staffing this year to align with our actual student counts. Even with this slight reduction, however, we were able to invest in staff positions that provide additional supports for students. As you see in this chart, we are making a $1.5 million investment in student services staff. We are up almost 5% in social workers, 3.5% in counselors, 3% in psychologists, 
2% in cross-categorical teachers, and almost 1% in MTAs. These are investments into our students and staff that are directly tied to the feedback we heard from the public, our families, and our staff. Once the staffing plan was determined, we set out to create our starting total compensation, which is total compensation is equal to the average step movement plus base wage, with our goal of meeting or exceeding the step plus base wage greater than the consumer price index of 2.44%. This budget includes a strong compensation package for staff, including fully funding steps and lanes and a minimum of 0.5% base wage increase with additional discussions pending the state budget passage. For healthcare, we set a ceiling of $2.5 million. Our provider's lowest offer came in a bit higher than our goal, and we needed to make a few minor plan changes in order to keep the total compensation balanced. Working with MTI, we will be increasing emergency room copay for staff, and employees choosing the point of service healthcare plan will see an employee percentage contribution increase this year. With $9 million needed to fund the total compensation position, 95% of all new revenue authority assumed in this budget is currently allocated towards total compensation. It then becomes the work of central office to identify items to repurpose in order to fund our strategic equity projects. Ultimately, we identified and reallocated over a million dollars to ensure that the strategic equity projects would be funded in line with the ongoing work of the strategic framework. Thus, protecting schools from local non-personnel cuts, the strategic equity projects built into this budget and listed on this screen are designed to be high impact, high leverage projects that will be sustained and expanded as necessary over time support the goals of the strategic framework. I'm gonna hand it over to Jen and Lisa to dive into more detail on the projects. All right, I'll kick it off with the first proposal which we discussed at the last operation work group meeting. Um, we introduced it there, and that is the idea of having a fund um, that would support the work of the Black Excellence Community Coalition uh, that Michelle Nichols, our head of family youth and community engagement has been working with. Um, as you know, that coalition um, will be sharing with the board in June a set of recommendations to support uh, African American students in not only their academic um, needs, but their, um, their needs to develop a healthy identity in our schools. Um, we don't know yet what those recommendations will be, but we think it's important to have a fund that has the opportunity and possibility to support it. Um, again, this is an initial proposal. I'm looking forward to the board shaping that proposal over time. Is it the right amount? Is it the right source of money? Um, we'll have that conversation in the next couple of months. But I'm excited about um, putting this particular uh, proposal on the table. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Lisa to walk you through the other major elements. Good night to you all. And I am going to talk a little bit about some proposed investments that align with our strategic framework. So this first investment um, directly speaks to goal number two in our strategic framework. It calls out staff retention so that the district and every school in it is a place where children, staff, and families can thrive. So in addition to the core investments that we make in school staff, we're focusing here on investments in positions that are hard, hardest to fill. This investment is part of our overall talent management strategy for special education cross-categorical teachers, which is the field with the highest turnover rates right now that we're seeing and the highest percentage of teachers on provisional licenses. This investment actually does three big things. It moves more teachers to full certification faster. It creates more stability in school teams so that teachers can deeply know and understand students and the needs that they have. And it eventually, we believe, will lead to stronger outcomes for students with disabilities. So the IELTS program that's displayed in this slide, along with our DPI grant, will see the first cohort of 25 students beginning this summer. And this will be an early ask for us to get this successfully, successfully launched moving forward. In addition, there's a smaller budget ask related to the Forward Madison work that we're doing. 
This is also a critical aspect of our overall talent management strategy as identified in goal two of the strategic framework. This position has been grant funded in the past and it's gradually coming, um, coming onto our local budget to indicate our commitment to the work that's part of our overall strategy. So the second thing that I wanna talk about a little bit is um, calling out our focus on investing in a positive and trusting um, culture and climate in schools that foster safe and thriving cultures in our schools. So this slide really summarizes our investments that support our work around social and emotional learning, restorative justice, and of course, behavior education. In addition to core resources, we're recommending some substantial additional investments in intensive supports for students. So first of all, we are proposing the addition of a social worker feeder pattern in the James Madison Memorial Attendance Area to support families across schools and students across schools as they access the resources, access the resources they need both within the district and also within the community. Next, um, we are excited to propose an expansion of mental health supports, specifically as it relates to behavioral health in schools. We're really excited to, um, to expand from eight to 12 schools moving forward. We have, have had a lot of interest in that. And our elementary bounce back, we're proposing an expansion of 20 to 24 schools. So we feel like that is a pretty healthy, aggressive um, step moving forward and we wanna keep pace with the needs that we have identified in our district. We're also recommending an increase of $200,000, as you can see, for professional learning for our schools. Um, we want to elevate the, the voice and the needs of our, um, our adults in this as to the level of uh, really the growth and expectations that we have for our students. So this funding is to support restorative justice, developmental designs, and school-related plans so that they can develop their own local plans to address their um, culture and climate needs. So the combination of these approaches does represent a pretty substantial investment in mental health services and supports for students across the district. And finally, um, the last investment that I'll address a little bit is about focused work on boosting, right in the end, our graduation rates and our post-secondary success that our students would experience. So this speaks to our investment in personalized opportunities for students. And we've talked about um, for a couple of years now, first of all, our early college STEM Academy that has had a really successful start. We've heard lots of testimony from students who have been involved. We have 25 students enrolled right now majority students of color or female, um, who are historically underrepresented in mathematics and science fields. And these students are at Madison College for their junior and senior year. They are thriving by all accounts, and we really have a healthy relationship with Madison College that we worked really hard at. So we are proposing with this additional investment from the board and the community, we're proposing to expand to 100 more students to benefit, this, benefit from this experience. So we'll grow from 25 to 125 students in this next year. Also, um, this slide denotes our additional um, 25 or more seats for programming in our upcoming micro school for next year. We learned a great deal from the pilot that we started. Um, we have worked very hard with our Office of Youth Reengagement and we're ready, we're ready to get this up and running with the quality and sort of the energy and verb that we really want moving into next year to support students who need it most. All right, there are a few open items still open for discussion that we will bring back to the board for consideration in the May Operation Work Group. These items include building additional capacity into our family, youth, and community engagement department to support black excellence, efforts to increase diversity, opportunity, and advanced learning, and supporting additional programming for mental health and special education students. We have reserved $800,000 in available local and title funding for these final board decisions. With all these forward-thinking investments for students and staff built in, I present to you a balanced operating budget using our assumed total revenue authority and resulting in an operating budget of $418 million. 
with an increase of 0.65 percentage in expenditures and a fund balance within the board policy at 12%. With all funds and all revenues included, we expect our total expenditures to actually slightly decline next year to 462 million. This is a slight decline largely due to the one-time spending in safety and security and the land purchase we made this year. As we reconcile end of year budgets, any unspent or unencumbered safety and security funding would be reconciled and would carry forward for the final October budget. For the local taxpayer, our property tax estimates are based on an assumption of maximum state equalization aid loss of 15%, negative 15%. Our current estimates produce a 6.2% tax levy increase. These numbers could improve based on the state budget outcomes. With the continued strong growth of the Madison region, we are expecting at least a 7% equalized tax-based growth, thus allowing our mill rate to decrease by approximately eight cents for every $1,000 in home value. Still, because property values continue to grow at such a fast pace here in Madison, we do estimate that the average homeowner would see an increase of about $86. Starting today, we start our public and board input phase. Our feedback tools, our social media outreach, and our websites have all been launched. We'll hold a set of focused feedback sessions throughout May, along with the traditional community input sessions at board meetings. Based on this feedback, along with board member amendments, we will spend the May and June operation work group meetings discussing and finalizing any needed revision in preparation for the 1920 June preliminary budget vote. That's what we have for you tonight. I'll turn it back over to Mary. Um, thank you, Kelly, Jen, Lisa. I know that there is a lot of work that goes into this budget. Um, the board has been discussing a lot of these items since January, even earlier. Um, so these are important issues, and we still have a lot of work to do. And, uh, and that work is not done until we get the final state budgets and know uh, how our funding looks. So, um, so I appreciate the work done to date and presenting the board um, with this uh, preliminary draft budget. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a report on the items that proceeded through our instruction work group. So I will report on those. The first item was uh, the new Western Window contract renewal, which we will be um, actually bringing to a vote uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, the second item is an update on the community schools and how that is going with regards to implementation. Um, the third item was uh, around behavioral health in schools. Uh, Kelly and Lisa covered some of those items in the, in the budget um, and certainly there has been a lot of uh, discussion and work that has gone into that tied into um, the behavior ad hoc committee that, uh, that Gloria has, has chaired. And so we want to make sure that the, that the budget priorities and the work that's being done ties into um, the work that the board has, has done. Uh, our next meeting for the instruction work group will be May 6th. And, uh, and the topics there are partnership renewals for Avid Tops and the Coupitude Escalera, along with our major uh, plans for our monitoring reports. Kate, do you wanna take us through the items that proceeded through operations work group? Sure, um, these guys just took us through a very detailed review of the budget, um, which we've been working on in every operations work group for the last, I don't know, six months or so, and we'll continue to uh, for the next six months or so. Um, so we have more work to do, picking up the, the kind of starting place that I guess we've been handed over now um, in the next work group. Um, the other two topics that we've reviewed, um, one is a slight update to policy 3540, um, which is graduation requirements, and then the second is a slight update to our internal transfer policy. Um, to support um, mainly kids who move over the summer and make it a little bit easier for them. And the next operations work group is oh, what am I missing? May 13th. Um, and there's two topics on the agenda. Um, it'll be, I think, a pretty um, weighty meeting. And the first topic is for this group to have our first chance to engage in the, in the budget and um, in particular discuss some of the priority options that we've left as draft to date. 
um, and then the second is for the building excellence plan um, and for this group, this new board, to have an opportunity to start to engage in our um, perspectives on a potential um, referendum for uh, capital expenditures. So, yes, yes. Um, I'm sorry, your your microphone um, is to or toes. I'm sorry. Yep. You aren't speaking into it. It's very difficult to hear what you're saying. Okay. Do you have any particular questions? I can, uh, no, I can no. repeat it. <laughs> I just want to be sure before yeah. we keep going. The sorry most important that. thing we're about to vote on to the policies, the most important thing is May 13th is our next operations work group, and that's when we really kind of do the nitty gritty work in terms of digging into the budget and, um, and the building excellence plan. So stay tuned, basically. Kate, I just have a follow-up on the budget. Uh, I know we've had some uh, numerous discussions during our operations work group, and I, but I just want to make sure when we have an opportunity for our new school board members, um, if they have any uh, questions in particular to the budget. I know we just received it, um, but uh, if there's any initial questions uh, that weren't that was not brought up during operations, maybe we could talk about that right now. Gloria, I actually love, because this is just a, an update from what happened at the work group right. meeting, so we do have, that's actually going to be the topic for May's operation work group, so I would say that's probably the best time to do that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure our new school board members were on board, if they had any quick questions uh, moving forward, that we have this opportunity to do that now. May 13th. Um, and uh, along with anything that we're voting on tonight, will be will right, we'll Mary. Be but I just want to make sure that our new school board members had anything initially that they could just ask in preparation for our future discussions in May. If not, fine. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up as an option for our new school board members. If they don't, then that's fine. Um, they can wait until May. Um, but just wanted to offer that. Um, just the, the feedback process. Um, how, how soon do we get the feedback reports from all the focus group and the um, online feedback? Yeah. Yep, so we run kind of a preliminary um, report just before the operation work group with, you know, what's been received to date, and then we run it again before the June um, operation work group. So monthly kind of rolling information. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, available at the public meeting. We kind of do a summary um, as well, and we'll, of course, email you what we got as well. Okay, so next item on the agenda is um, the action items that proceeded through the instruction work group. Um, the partnership renewal with regards to behavioral health will be part of the consent agenda. Um, so the item, uh, the only other item through the instruction work group uh, is with regards to the Nuestro Mundo the charter school contract. And uh, I will move that the Board of Education approve the charter contract for the Nuestro Mundo Community School as set forth in the documents from the April 29, 2019 regular meeting for a term of five years beginning July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2024. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Um, yeah, at first I want to say that I really support this contract renewal. It's a great direction for our district to be moving in to support this school. However, um, I, um, in preparation for this vote, I pulled up the um, data we have on both Nuestro Mundo and Frank Alice, um, just for the audience, the Nuestro Mundo school pulls from the Frank Alice attendance area. And you, we've got a lot of disparities between those two schools. Frank Alice serves um, a lot more black children. Um, it's a much more high poverty school. So moving forward from this vote, I strongly advocate that um, as we make decisions about the future of this attendance area, we're not just looking through the lens of Nuestro Mundo, whose parents you know, come here and advocate, tell us really great stuff, 
but we're also considering the needs of our children at Frank Ellis, um, who aren't here to advocate necessarily. I get a reputation of being notoriously difficult at charter school. I admit it, I own it. However, Nuestro Mundo happens to be one that is an instrumentality charter. It does what it needs to do. They're, they have followed absolutely everything we've said. And I do like their meditation program, watching a three year old and giving me lower the pulse text we have. <laughs> probably irrelevant for this topic. Um, but I, I feel that, but I think Chris brings up a great point. And that is, I am all, I'm going to vote for Norris for Moon. I believe in that, but I do not want to ignore Fred Bellis. And I, I'm going to all 50 schools this year. Alice was my first, because I was trying to do it alphabetically, then I went out of order. And very simply, there is definite need there. This is definitely a high poverty school, and I don't want that to be ignored or minimized. I don't like pitting one school against another, so if we could just keep them that way, because I don't like comparing one versus the other, because you'll never get it right, you'll never get it fair. Thank you, Nikki. I think it's really important, and I, I like to chime in. It's five years ago, I was a parent speaking to the board in support of the contract. And now I get the pleasure to be here and vote yes for the contract and also have witnessed uh, the hard work that the staff and the parents uh, have put in into the contract and the amazing uh, progress that the school um, has accomplished over the last uh, 10 years, really, with a change of building and whatnot. Um, so thank you, Nikki, for uh, separating the issues. Um, I think that's really important that we really frame uh, schools with um, uh, with the right issues so the public doesn't get confused. So thank you. Okay. Another comment? Uh, Am I your advisory vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 7-0. Okay, next are the action items that proceeded through the operations work group. Um, so as Kate had mentioned, we spent um, a fair amount of time on the, on the budget. There are a couple of early items. Um, these are ones in which, um, well, I'll read the motion and then um, you'll hear. So I will move that the Board of Education grant early approval of the following 2019-20 budget request to facilitate timely ordering of long lead time materials, equipment, and to accelerate uh, or to accelerate necessary planning for summer programming. Uh, A, an increase of $525,000 to the 2018-19 technology plan budget to support the new G5 schools and B, an increase of $121,000 to the Forward Madison UW Partnership Budget to support the Accelerated Licensure and Special Education Program. Second. Okay, any comments, questions? Yeah, thank you. On the aisle, normally I am not for programs that rush or move things forward. I make exception when we have an absolute need. And right now, every school I've been to has had the same thing. Because the one I was at this morning, I was at LVM. We need special education teachers. We need CC teachers. We need SEAs. And very simply, we're, we're not doing fast enough. And I think this is one of the ways where we can catch up to create a program that's actually found a program that is an online program that doesn't have a specification. It actually has specifications with our district because we're the ones creating the specifications. So that's why I'm supporting uh, the other Chris. Chris. Um, so I just want to speak briefly about the technology plan. Um, I think it's kind of late in the process to be putting the brakes on it right now, so I'm not going to do that. However, um, moving into the coming budget cycle, I would like to strongly advocate for um, putting this program under the microscope. 
we've heard a lot of staff speak, we've heard a lot of students speak um, about what our student population needs to do better, and we've heard everything from more student support to um, more staff in our schools, especially special education staff, more student services. We have not heard one-to-one -one devices as the solution from any of these groups that gather and talk to us. Um, they talk about needing more people in our schools, they need to talk about wellness and healthy food. They don't talk about technology. I think as a board, we need to think hard about the fact that we're investing, I think, more than $4 million this year. This will be a $6 million investment once we have fully implemented the plan. Is one-to-one -one technology the best way for us to close gaps and move forward? Or are there other better ways to spend that money? Um, I'm not saying we answer that or solve that now, but as we move into the coming budget cycle, I would actually like to, to have some options to look at that money so especially look at one-to-one -one devices in the lower grades where we know there's lots of suggestions about not giving small children as much screen time as we do. And you know, it's, it's not necessarily gonna be a ton of money, but it might be a smarter way to invest our really scarce resources to, to re-examine that program. Thank you. Um, what I hear the most from the one-to-one -one devices is from my low-income parents. I do a lot of public defender work, and I hear a lot, we talk a lot of low-income parents about I don't have $200 if I can't drop my, their Chromebook. I can't afford to fix the screen. I can't afford to do this. I don't know where this money is going to come from. And I keep hearing that, and it's not once or twice, I keep hearing it again and again. I'm not going to vote against the program, it's too late. At the same point, do I believe it needs to be under the microscope? Absolutely, because I'm worried about the financial hardship it does cause our lower income parents because as someone who's dropped in approximately six laptops, which is why they're all double insured, um, and knowing that expense of it, I can tell you, it adds up really, really quickly. And to be honest, I can see why the parents are worried about that. So, yes, I would like it under the microscope. No, I am not going to do it, to vote against it in April when we need them to do it. No, no, that doesn't matter. Um, yeah, Jim? I just I want a clarification on what does that mean under the microscope? I think it means looking at the technology plan, not just from um, a high level and saying we're, we're just doing this and here's what it will cost and here's the additional cost this year. But actually looking at the full investment we have been making since the beginning of this plan and um, making decisions about if we want to continue to move forward in that direction or if we want to make some changes. Like the way we do the budget right now, we're mostly looking at the additional funds. We're adding on to an existing plan. I think we look at everything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Jen. Um, yeah. I just, I do want, I appreciate that comment. Um, and as a, a reminder to the board, and this will be actually something that we're talking about um, at the instruction work group coming up, the uh, monitoring cycles for evaluation and the kind of uh, sequence of, of those uh, deeper looks and, and deep evaluations, uh, which includes the tech plan. It is on a cycle of deep evaluation uh, every multiple years. And I don't know, Lisa, do you remember off the top of your head? I know, <laughs> that's maybe not fair in the moment. When is it? When is the tech plan evaluation up? Does anybody, any staff member in the audience know off the top of their head? It's actually the last one in that time that um, review cycle. Oh, so it's not coming up next? No. Oh, I thought that it had been a few years ago that we did the last one. Yeah, it's not coming up next. It, when it does come up, it's after full implementation in all the schools. Ah, uh, after we get through the G6 and 7, yeah. So let's look at that cycle together, right? This will be the board's opportunity to look at frequency because we do have a way of working that allows us at pivotal points to do a, a deep full evaluation of our major programs, which includes the technology plan. Uh, maybe just to add the, um, the process for us as a, as a team, as a group, to kind of set the agenda for the year is coming up. So we have an opportunity, I believe, in August to August. have a public discussion around what kind of our group agendas are for the year for both our instruction work group and for operations work group. That's right. Um, so we get 12, 12 at bats um, for the year to kind of set the topics that we want to dig into. So I think you know we have a we have a chance over the summer to define that as a team and really how we want to approach that for next budget. Yeah, that's right. Gloria. 
So I, I approve this. I think that, um, you know, I'm a bit old school too. I mean, I think that uh, a little bit too much technology and too fast, um, but that's the future. I mean, it's moving, it's moving quickly. Uh, we need to prepare our children uh, for the technologies to come. Uh, and looking at other districts uh, who are near us, they're way ahead of us. I think technology is the way of the future, and we have to figure, figure out how to do this right. Um, so I definitely support um, uh, this. I do think it's uh, an interesting thing to talk about the relevance of technology while we all sit with our devices. But I do. I do think there's there's that to be said for this conversation. Um, I also think that I, my my greatest concern is kind of the mixed message that young people are getting between elementary school, middle school, and high school, in which they're being handed a Chromebook at the age of six and being told to put their cell phone away at the age of sixteen. Um, I do think that our ability to talk to young people about how they conduct themselves on social media is is a profound opportunity to really shape the climate. For our students, um, but I have questions about kind of what we're looking at in terms of relevant technology. And so I think looking at who has access to 3D printing um, is something that is, is important to me. I grew up in a household without a computer. I think that extending the ability to engage with technology is, uh, is really important. And I think for our, our students who have diverse needs, um, technology can, can create a bridge to the classroom. And so I am, I am for this part. Okay, um, so we have a motion and we have a second. Uh, Major Geiserville? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> okay, that passes 7-0. Uh, a second item that uh, proceeded through the operations work group that is up for a vote is with regards to graduation requirements. And so I will move that the Board of Education approve the revisions to Board Policy 3540, graduation requirements as set forth in the documents prepared for the April 29, 2019 regular board meeting with said revisions to take effect immediately. Second. Okay, any uh, discussion? Amad, your advisor vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 7-0. Uh, the next item is uh, with regards to revisions to Board Policy 4023. Uh, it is recommended that the Board of, uh, I will move that the Board of Education approve the revisions to Board Policy 4023, internal transfers as set forth in the documents prepared for the regular board meeting dated April 29, 2019 with said revisions to take effect immediately. Second. Okay. Discussion? Amad, your advisor vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 7-0. Okay, we're then on to our consent agenda. Um, and so we make the main motion and then uh, board members uh, can ask to separate any of the items that they would like to separate from that main motion, from that vote, and then we'll come back to those items and uh, discuss and vote separately. So I will move that the Board of Education adopt and approve all the motions set forth in section 10 of the electronic agenda prepared for the April 29, 2019 regular school board meeting exactly as said motions are written. By voting affirmatively on this motion, a board member expresses his or her affirmative vote on each of the motions consolidated hereby, subject to any express separations that have been made by any member of the board. Okay, any separations? Chris. I would like to separate 10.15, purchase classroom technology for G5 schools. Okay. Any other separations? Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Um, if I, if I'm advisor, Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that passes 7 0, and we will go to 10.15, which is uh, classroom technology for G5 schools. Chad, you want to come up here? Chad, you need, I don't know if Chad, you need any help on this, but. Like I help with anything I can do. Chris, if you All don't right. mind. Um, so um, this piece of the consent agenda is basically purchasing large screen monitors for every 
classroom in group D5 of the technology plan. Um, my concern with this is that um, different teachers have different technology needs in their classrooms, and this assumes that everybody has a standard need for a large screen monitor. Um, like math teachers need to be able to write stuff. They may not want to use a large screen monitor. Um, I know from past implementation of this that some teachers are using these monitors and they love them, and some teachers they're collecting dust. And I just don't want to invest in a technology for every classroom using a top-down approach if some of those monitors are going to collect us. You know, our resources are scarce. So um, I would prefer, before we approve this expenditure, that we actually go out to teachers and talk to them and find out if this is the technology they want. And if, you know, if there is a way to like let teachers pass on getting a large screen monitor to save some money, I support that. Mary. Uh, yes. The problem with the large screen television that is going into schools isn't the idea of large screen television. What I keep seeing is the fact that they're not working. That I keep seeing people fuddling with cables, calling it maintenance, saying the TV is down, the internet is down with the TV, or it's not working. I think we need to make sure the technology is workable and works with the individual before. And because that's what it's been in three or four, actually, a bunch of five schools where they keep struggling with it, and that's problematic. Chair, do you think you could speak to the standards, standardization issue that Chris was mentioning and Nikki's concern about technology breakdowns? Yeah, we, we've certainly had, well, I'll start with the standardization. Uh, we've uh, certainly had uh, those discussions with schools around uh, the need certain teachers not necessarily knowing if they're ready to implement the technology uh, when the G cycle rolls through their specific site. Um, I think the uh, what we're hearing from our instructional team uh, is that there is it's important to supply uh, kind of a basic foundation in terms of classroom technology. And that's the goal of the plan. Uh, and some teachers are more ready than others uh, when uh, the new flat screen TV rolls into the room. I think some of the things we'd bump into if we started to uh, splinter this and allow some teachers to say, no, this device isn't for me this year. Um, we got a, we have a kind of a tiered budget that we're trying to make sure by the time we're done with this thing, uh, every classroom in the district uh, has that basic foundational technology. Uh, and I think what we could run into would be uh, a teacher the next year saying we're ready and we haven't budgeted for it. Uh, we could run into a teacher um, moving schools uh, or retiring, and we haven't budgeted for it. Um, and uh, I think the goal all along was to put a device in every student's hands, uh, as we talked about, and I think that can be uh, opportunity gap closing work uh, and uh, putting a, a basic level of technology in all of our classrooms, and that's what, that's what we try to accomplish. Um, so we are exploring behind the scenes uh, on the on the technical side, along with TJ's team on the instructional side, uh, there, there's new technology that allows for um, touch capacity on the screens that would be uh, more useful in some cases for uh, a math teacher or a science teacher, potentially an art teacher. Uh, and the cost of those devices is actually starting to come down, where we may start to allow uh, some, of our, some of our sites to have choices when it comes to uh, different functionality with the devices. But for the time being, uh, our stance has been uh, have a standard approach in terms of foundational technology in the classroom. Uh, I think this allows for the instructional side to uh, share best practices so everyone's kind of starting on the same page. That's been our approach. Breakdown like Nikki. Yeah, Nikki, I certainly haven't heard that. And you, if you ask the specific teachers you bumped in, we certainly want to hear it. We have, uh, I've got Jeff Knudsen here. We've got, uh, I, would, I would say, the fastest acting group of uh, I'll definitely send an email because they, they get right on it. What we've actually found is uh, these things are a hundred times more reliable than the data projectors and any other display devices we've had. That they're uh, other, you know, other than maybe some user error in terms of training, uh, these things have kind of been bomb proof right? for us. Yeah, they've been really, really reliable. Can I ask you about the appropriate utilization of the device? I can attempt to answer that, sure. Yeah, so how, how often do we want young people to be engaging with the screen? How frequently are they being used? Uh, what, what, do you, what is the appropriate utilization of, of the tool? 
I would I'd certainly lean on Lisa and the instructional side more so to potentially answer that question. Um, I, I, I think we are learning as we go. Um, and uh, as I think I heard someone mention, we're all, all of us are even up here on devices tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, technology certainly has a role in preparing a 21st century learner. Um, I don't think we want kids on screens 24-7. Um, but um, I think we're trying to find that, uh, that, balance, that, that right balance in the classrooms. Uh, so there's not a prescribed utilization. Uh, a teacher who might have a more fluid approach to engaging with the device um, can can use it to enhance their strengths and also isn't required to, you know, project onto this, this device. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm in, in classrooms a lot, and I think there's a real range of use, Ellie, and we want teachers to have the flexibility to use all of the instructional materials available to them, including the ability to project um, in a way that makes uh, the most sense to them. I mean, I think the opportunity to incorporate multimedia into the classroom is a powerful thing for students who haven't had enough life experience to see and understand things up close, and it's just a way to I'll make it real in the classroom. Um, it can reduce barriers for students who um, are acquiring language, right? Because you can, you know, show images right in real time, right? As, it, as a misunderstanding arises in the classroom, hey, let's go check that out together, right? Let's explore it. I mean, it just there's so many possibilities that uh, this kind of technology provides. I think. Um, I think TJ McCray, we could certainly follow up with some uh, ideas about the kind of guidance and training we provide for teachers when it comes to using the basic technology set up in their classrooms. But we also want teachers to, to use it to explore the world around them with the students in their, in their classrooms in real time, right? So it's much more adaptive than a, a textbook, I'll say that. And I love textbooks too, right? It's not either or, but there's, um, opportunities to reduce barriers that otherwise would be would, would exist in the classroom. Yeah. yeah. I think Emma like might have some insight yeah. on see Emma. a student. Um, so. I just had a question. Do you guys collect survey data on um, from teachers on how much they use the devices, how helpful they are to them in the classrooms, and are you seeing like any differences based on the type of class? So I, I think that type of data definitely came through the last time that we did a big deep dive into the tech plan. And I think the next time uh, this comes around, those are the exact types of questions we'll be asking. Yeah, yeah, there was, uh, we can certainly send you the old uh, evaluation results, but there was a qualitative aspect which included a survey yep. to set at that point. Yeah, Chris? Um, when we did that um, survey, the deep dive on the tech plan, how many of the large screen monitors were actually being used at that point? Was implementation even That's happening? That's a really good question. I mean, I think we were maybe only a year or two in at that point, so the sample size was obviously a lot smaller at that point. So, yeah. I, I still feel that it would be better to just delay this a little bit, and it would not be that hard to send a quick two-question survey out to our staff just to see what utilization looks like and decide if this is a good investment to do in every single classroom if the standardization approach is really the best approach. I think staff voice matters in this decision, and we haven't done a good enough job of listening. I, yeah, I will say, and you guys can certainly vote how you want tonight. Yeah. It's, it's here uh, in front of you tonight because there's a long runway uh, to get these devices into classrooms by the time of September 1st hits. Um, so we've got to get them ordered. We have to build all those plans all summer and actually get them implemented in the school. Um, so it, it, there's a reason we don't send it in the end of June, and it's from the budget approval because we have to get them ordered, get them shipped here, you know, they assemble them together. Yeah, and not that, and then we're so I'll be someone that also don't appreciate incentivization, um, but I don't see the tech plan uh, as one. I see as a message that how we need to be prepared, both as adults and also yeah. expose our students. Uh, as someone that did not grow up with a, a, a computer in my school, uh, but now I can't think of hardly any profession that would not use some sort of electronic device. Um, that you know, and, and I also remember when we were asking questions about, do you want to change to Gmail? 
and to Google Drive. Many people said no, because it's hard. It requires a learning curve. Um, but it, you know, we are now in this, you know, another platform of coding. Like, you know, so I, you know, I, I, I'm worried about sending a message that, um, yes, you know, if you want to provide students with an exposure of the, this, this accessibility, this career opportunity, uh, this uh, ways of teaching that are much more interactive, uh, yes or no, I worry that we're sending a message that, you know, that pro, you know precludes us from 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 um, from exposing our students to a type of uh, um, tool that they must use uh, if they're already not already using at this point. So I get I get a little concerned about the message around that, and I don't think that is a misdemeanorization. Uh, yeah, I I would say I don't I don't want to delay this. I mean. Chris, I think you, I, I agree with you that um, that this program and how we move, move forward in the long-term investment in technology and the role that it plays and whether one-to-one -one devices um, uh, at what age are appropriate, but actually the screens that bring every student together and interacting with the, with the teacher, I think is incredibly important in, in a classroom. And so if they're going to have computers, I want them to have the screen that, that helps the learning and the interaction between the teacher, other students, and, and brings everyone together instead of all the students just sitting on their own devices doing their, their own thing. So I would not want to delay this. I think also the surveys are a good idea. One, to, to look at what the issues might be with people adopting new technologies and whether, in fact, they need greater support, whether there are mechanical issues, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't hold back. I do believe every every classroom that's going to have devices for students should have uh, screens that bring people together. Okay, I'm gonna. It's, we have everyone here, so it's going to be. We're just going this way, and I'd ask that people let's um, see if we have one final comments on. Gloria? Yeah, I won't repeat everything. I, I okay. think, um, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to delay this either. I think we are here for a reason. I mean, I think uh, our administration, our staff, I mean, I think that um, because of what, you know, it's the future of technology, right? I mean, um, that our, I believe that our teachers and our students are, are, are asking for this. I don't think that we are coming up with this out of, nowhere and I think that uh, we I, it becomes an equity issue if we are not consistently providing um, access to technology for all of our students uh, so I, I think delaying this um, I would not support okay um, so maybe just I, I, I don't want to delay this either and, um, I, and I'm married to a math teacher who comes home covered in chalk still um, and would never forgive me if I, I didn't um, articulate, I think, a perspective that uh, this is a tool to be used in engaging a classroom, and it's a tool to build from and to use differently for different subject matters at different times of the day with different kids at different ages. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm really eager and excited to hear about some of the um, additional ways that we can use a screen that isn't staring at it like staring at it right now if that's a I know there's some things that you can still actually use like a projector and it, it actually uh, yep, we've got that in many of our schools um, so I, I'm hearing a lot of interest from this group in the instructional ways that technology can be used um, because it's just it's just another tool in our arsenal um, and uh, certainly I think I, a huge proponent for many of our kind of content areas to use it in different ways than just staring at a screen so I do, I want to push back a little bit on, on the idea that the people we want to talk to about the utilization of the tool are the teachers. And I, I also want to acknowledge that we, we talked about diversity as an issue in terms of New Estra Mundo. Um, I think when you're talking about, you know, surveying our educators, that you're talking about losing the voices of, of communities of color, that you're talking uh, about, you know, who isn't going to be at the table in terms of that survey. I also think that we are obligated to consider 
diverse learners um, in this conversation. And so asking young people, how do you benefit from technology in the classroom should be an essential part of the way we have this dialogue. Um, so if we have diverse lear learners in our classrooms and we wanna bring in all kinds of people and all kinds of ideas, um, this is a presen presentation tool. And honestly, I can't remember the last time I was at a presentation in which uh, technology was not utilized. Um, and so I, I think the fact that it is not prescriptive, that no educator is expected to engage with this tool exclusively, to burn their blackboard and their textbooks and do everything via screen, um, I think, you know, there, there is a, a lot of potential for growth in the utilization of the tool, and I think if we're interested uh, uh, in the ways that educators feel about the tools, we should also be very interested and committed to how young people access their education in terms of the utilization of the tool. Okay, um, any other thoughts? Yeah, Iman. Um, one final thought, I'm going to vote yes on this just because I don't want to deny um, any class the access to this type of technology. Um, but I'd be interested in looking at the different ways, as Kate said, this could be used rather than just, like I see in many of my classrooms, the, like, the monitor is just a replacement. Oh, it has a clearer screen than my projector, so I'm gonna use that instead. Um, versus how we can actually find innovative ways um, to teach interactively that you can't get from a more basic form. Okay, so I will move um, that uh, that we accept three bids, one in the amount of $350,200 from Troxel Communications, Inc. for 340 65-inch monitor displays, a second bid in the amount of $156,620 from Troxel Communications, Inc. for 410 mobile display stands for 65-inch display monitors, and a third bid in the amount of $98,340 from CDW-G for 66, 65-inch interactive monitors <coughs> to establish a total lease cost of $605,160 to be financed through a four-year DBO capital lease, which will be awarded to American Capital Financial Services and funding for the from the 2019-20 Technology <coughs> Technical Services Division operating budget. Second. Uh, Am I your advisor? No. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, so that passes by two. Okay. Kate Chris and I'm. Uh, so that covers uh, everything that was part of um, the consent budget then, or the consent action items. And so with that, um, our next uh, item is other reports to the board, starting with um, Student Senate, am I? Uh, student Senate met twice this month, um, once on April 3rd and once on the 17th. Um, during that time, we continued collaborating with um, some district staff on diving into the class size policy, um, long-term facilities planning for the district, and the role that advanced learning plays in our schools. Um, we planned action items on these topics, both short-term for the last couple months of this year, um, and then just moving to the future long-term for the next um, couple of years. Um, we also at one of our meetings discussed the possibility um, of an MMSD alumni network um, and how that could help former students find connections to support their future um, in different areas. Um, and finally, we are currently in the process of electing new office positions for the 1920 school year. Um, the candidate for um, Student Senate President for next year is Rebecca Cutforth, um, a junior from Memorial High School. And for student board representative, um, the candidates are Mia Kurzer, a sophomore from Shabazz, and Anika Semel, a sophomore from Memorial. Okay, and uh, let's see, your next meetings? Ramon? Next meetings are this Wednesday, May 1st, and then another one on May 15th. Okay, great, thank you. Hey, Mary, can I chime in real quick on sure. this? Um, Iman, I, I saw that Anika was at the public speaking portion of this meeting and it made me wonder if the 
the issue of sexual assault, sexual harassment, Title IX, might be something that the Student Senate might want to think about yeah, taking up. I'm sure. I don't know if that's come up in conversation already, but I, I think, just wondered about it. Yeah, both um, Anika and Rebecca spoke to that, so I think um, like they brought it up the last meeting, and we'll continue to talk about that um, as the issues come up. Okay, so um, there is no old or new business for this meeting. So the last item on our agenda is adjournment. Um, second. <laughs> I will make the motion to adjourn, and we have a second. Uh, Imad, your advisor vote. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned, and thank you once again to everyone who made this uh, meeting possible at.